What's up guys, welcome to the Bearded Jeeper Podcast. On this podcast, we'll talk about jeeps, off-roading, overlanding, rock crawling, and much more. Alright guys, welcome to the Bearded Jeeper Podcast. This is episode two, and my guest today is Nate, SWB Crawler on YouTube. Welcome, Nate. Uh, hey man, thanks for having me. So so I wanted to to get you to first to just kind of go over your give everyone your origin story people that haven't heard of you what is your youtube channel about how'd you get started on youtube well uh, what about jeeps uh, that kind of thing my origin story it's like i'm a comic book character you are do we have to go into this big long arc about how i was born in a dumpster and led a life of uh <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that might lead to an interesting <laughs> podcast for sure. Yeah, right. It'd all be fake, of course, but, you know, whatever. All right. So who am I and what's my channel about? All right. So I'm Nate, as you said. Um, I've been Jeeping since I was in, well, college. I picked up uh, my first Jeep when I was 19. Um, and I've just, I don't think I, there's been a point where I didn't own a Jeep, whether it ran or not, since then. So we're talking 21 years now. So if you want to do the math on how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I mean, I started out with an old 90 YJ, learned to drive manual on that, on that thing, burned out the clutch, uh, got addicted to off-roading and the Wrangler lifestyle. Uh, being able to take the top of the doors off is really the thing that I've always loved about the Wrangler. I don't care about the status symbol that it seems to have turned into. I just love the freedom that it seems to give me. Um, I've had that. I had a 92 YJ for a long time. I had a uh, 2013 JK for a while. I uh, decided that was too expensive and I was afraid to wheel it because I was always worried about the uh, the detriment to its value. <laughs> they definitely are expensive to wheel. Yeah. Yeah. I got rid of that uh, for a 2005 Jeep LJ. And somewhere in the middle there, I had an XJ for a little while. I had a 90 YJ that never ran. That might be everything. Oh, and I had a Jeep Patriot for a little while. <laughs> we won't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That wasn't that wasn't a Jeep Jeep that I was. That was actually just a commuter car. So I had. Did a you actually at the same time find? I, um, I, I my wife had one of those for a little bit. Did you notice a big blind spot in the top too? Like in the, how the uh, the windshield came down? Yes, I I, I, I really. It. it wasn't a great vehicle to drive. The visibility wasn't awesome, but you know, whatever. It got me to and from work at, at more than 20 miles per gallon, which was good enough for me. Yeah, so, definitely. Without driving a little uh, sedan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I could force myself to drive some kind of little sedan or... Yeah, I I did for a while. I was trying to be good. Um, I had a little Dodge Neon I was driving every day and my YJ was parked at home, but it every day it killed my soul just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so what's my channel about? Uh, basically, up until now, anyway, it's been mainly around um, kind of some of my opinions around wheeling and how it should be done and, and how people should do it responsibly. Um, mainly, it's been a lot of uh, sort of mechanical how-tos and whatnot around that 2005 LJ. Some of the modifications I've done to it, some of the repairs I've done to it, things like that. I've recently got a little deeper into fabrication, which is a thing that I've always done but I never thought I was good enough to share with anybody. And I decided to just say, heck with it. And I'm going to start sharing it with people. And uh, all I can do is get better at it, right? Yeah, Mark and, and I uh, were actually talking about that. And we, we thought that it was uh, it is really nerve wracking showing yeah. like, your welds specifically. Yeah. Yep. As soon as you show a weld on the internet, all the experts show up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then um, about a year ago, we bought my wife a four-door JK. And I'm starting to slowly, we're going to build that into sort of a family wheeler while my LJ turns more into a more of the hardcore vehicle that I want it to be. So that's kind of what's coming in the future. A lot more fabrication, a lot more JK content, and of course the LJ that's always been there. Nice. So uh, what, what made you want to start YouTube though? Like, was it, did you get like the bug uh, after making one video and you kind of just propelled from there or what what made you want to start i tell you what i don't know how common this story is but basically um i've run swbcrawler.com and before that uh, uh another jeep related site that really didn't have a great name which is why i changed to SW, swbcrawler.com for like 15 years now right and it's always been about me 
like whenever I do a thing that I think can help others, whenever I do something that I thought was tricky to solve or that I thought it was hard to find the information on or that it took me some time to figure out, I share it back to the community because I want people to be able to do the thing that I just did without having to go pay a mechanic or without having to go, you know, find an expert and bring them to your house and give them beer, right? Or whatever, <laughs> even though that's a big thing that's in the Jeeping community, right? Uh, so eventually that, you know, text medium, text and photo medium is slowly becoming less and less of a thing, right? Look at magazines, they're going away, right? Video is really where it is. So a couple of years ago, I decided, all right, I'm going to try to make a video. I had no idea what I was doing. And I made one or two and it was kind of fun. And I learned a few things. And then to me, it became just another challenge. Can I do better? Can I make a better video? Can I share the content in a way that people are going to really enjoy? And that's what I've been trying to do ever since. And it's really become kind of an addiction, right? Along with the Jeep, along with working on it. It's like, if I'm doing anything in the garage, I feel like I should be recording this and I should share it with people, even if it's the simplest of things. So that's really, it kind of grew like that. And that's, that's kind of how I try to keep it. Even though it's really tempting, right? To just be one of these rich and famous YouTube stars and just not care about the content you're creating and do whatever you think is going to pander to the audience. That's not really my thing. Yeah, I think you got to kind of love what you're doing and uh, really uh, it, it shows in your videos that you uh, want to teach and you want to show people what you're doing and you're not just saying, hey, I, I can do this, I can afford this or yeah. kind of showing off what you have basically. Um, so uh, you mentioned fabricating stuff and you're getting into that and you, you made a front bumper recently uh, for mm -hmm. the LJ. And uh, so, so what's your next big fabrication project coming along? So I've got a couple things in the works. One that, that you're sort of privy to is I recently came into an affordable bender or tube bender. So that I'm hoping is going to turn into a tube fender project as soon as I get some experience with the thing. So I think first what I'm going to do is, is make a tube hoop for that, the bumper that I already made, you know, is sort of get some practice. Um, I want to, maybe add a step to the sliders that I built years ago, that sort of thing. And there's going to be a front bumper and winch build for the JK coming up. Uh, so that'll be a thing may or may or may, may not include that tube bender. But uh, those are kind of the things that I, I sort of immediately want to start working on once I have the, the time and the funds to start getting materials together to get that done. I've also been saying for a long time, I want to build a rack for the rear of the LJ, like in the cargo area in the back, because that's a thing that's hard to find because there's not a lot of aftermarket support for the LJ anymore. You know, things that are LJ specific, that is, because there were right, so many right. years that things made. TJ, you can find everywhere, but LJ, because of the extended interior and only a three-year range of these things, a lot of aftermarket vendors just don't care anymore. Yeah, you really have to kind of almost customize anything you would pick up for it. Yeah. Yeah. Now the hardcore places like Generate and um, places like that that build armor, they absolutely still support the LJ. Oh, Metal Club is the other one I was thinking. Uh, they still build like side armor for the LJ because they know it's a very popular wheeling platform. But uh, a lot of places you just, you know, like the general places that you'd go to Quadratech or whatever and look for a cargo rack, they don't even list the LJ anymore because it just, it's not a thing. They don't sell that much of it. Yeah, like, and, and Genrite stuff is wicked nice. It's like top of the line. They're aluminum stuff, but I yeah. just can't get over that price tag. Like, No, you're right. You're right. I'm it, sure it is high incredible. quality, but it's too deep for my pockets. <laughs> yeah, like I was actually looking at a gas tank uh, replacement for my JK because I've had issues with it and uh, connecting like the EVAP lines and stuff. So I, I was like, oh, l let me look and try to replace it. But uh, the only decent one i could find was uh generate makes this really nice one that goes where your stock exhaust is on the jk and kind of tucks right up in there has an integrated yeah. skid plate and everything but i i don't remember how much exactly it was but probably way like over, bucks. yeah it was way <laughs> over my price uh, price range i mean yeah so it puts it, it it puts it back where it used to be on the old wranglers yeah exactly they, they moved it away from there because of the the risk of fire from uh, rear end collisions Huh. I haven't seen that many Wranglers burst into flames, but I guess they had enough of those. What was it? The 
was it the Grand Cherokee or something? There was something that they had a whole bunch of cases where rear end impacts were making them burst into flames and they decided, let's not do this anymore. Let's yeah, I mean, gas tank. <laughs> I know the JKs were catching fire, but that was, I believe, the uh, it had like something leaking onto the exhaust or something and it was like transmission fluid or something that was that'll do it exhausts fire. exhausts are hot and transmission fluid is flammable <laughs> yeah uh back a couple of years ago we were doing the uh, uh mount washington uh jeep invasion where we like kind of have like a, a day with a bunch of vendors and stuff and then we get a bunch of jeeps and drive up top of mount washington well it's it's pretty steep and you're going pretty slow and uh my jeep would 37s it, it didn't like it too much and it kept overheating so i had to quit that time and drive back down because it it started uh leaking out a little transmission fluid and smoking and stuff so i'm mm. like no i'm not burning my jeep to the ground today none of that. None of that. no not at all uh so mark and i talked about toughest trails and so I wanted to get your opinion on what are the some of the toughest trails you've been on and we kind of touched on two that I personally think uh, East Coast trails can be a little harder than West Coast trails. West Coast trails are more kind of technical, um, yeah. but th they have more traction out there, whereas we kind of have a lot of that mud and stuff before the rocks and you just can't get any grip. So I have always been a very... Um, I don't know, conservative wheeler. I don't like to break my stuff, especially because up until recently, in fact, literally up until I took the most recent job I have now, I had to depend on my Jeep to get me to and from work every day. Much like you, right? Yep. You don't have a daily driver either. Uh, so usually when I'm out on the trails, uh, I really judge the trail before I hit it, right? So the LJ hasn't been on a ton of extremely tough trails. Um, I do mostly greens and blues but it is only on 33s and it's got almost no lift, right? So uh, I've run into a lot of people that they see me out on the trails in, you know, in this relatively little LJ and they're like, how are you doing this? <laughs> how are you wheeling this thing on blues? I'm like, well, I just know the Jeep and I've been doing it a long time. Um, that, that having been said, I've seen a lot of really crazy trails and there's a, there's a number of them at AOAA. Uh, but where I really saw the insane trails was at a park that is no longer in existence here in Pennsylvania called Paragon Adventure Park. And um, I've heard that people still wheel the land, but it's completely illegal, right? So you don't want to get caught doing it. Is it like um, private were, land now? or It's owned by a land developer, I think, who kind of went defunct. So nobody's like patrolling it or anything, but you're still mm -hmm. not supposed to be in there, right? Um, but there, they had some insane trails. They were just like mountains of rock that they would bring in flat out competition buggies. Now this was 2006. I think they closed up 2005. So, you know, imagine the way the sport looked then it, they didn't, you didn't, you didn't have ultra four buggies and stuff like that. Right. Um, but the competition crawlers of the time that were on like 37s, 38s, coilovers, buggy frames and all that, um, they would come and there was a, there was a whole wheeling competition that went on there. Insane trails you can, you can get to there. Um, AOA is building one. I don't know if you've heard about yeah, this. Yeah. They're, they're kind of trying to emulate like the Rubicon trail or something like that. Yes. I think I heard. So there's, there's like AOA is built on a bunch of old coal land, like a lot of stuff here in Pennsylvania because the coal mining industry just sort of dried up. Uh, and then there's all this land that has trails throughout it. So everybody's been wheeling that kind of stuff because you can, right? And nobody's watching it because the coal companies are gone. Well, AOAA was built on a bunch of old coal land that got taken back by the state or the county, I guess. The county commissioner owned all this. And I could give you the whole story at some point if you really wanted to hear it. But uh, what it basically turned into is a couple guys figured out that all this land is owned by the county. And they proposed to the county, why don't we turn it into an off-road park? You can make some money out of it. We'll run it for you. Everybody's happy. And that's how yep. AOAA was born, right? So um, there's this old strip mine there that's full of water, right? And the EPA came in and they basically said, this water is so non-conducive to life <laughs> that it just, it needs to be gone. We're going to, we're going to help you guys get a state grant to fill it in with dirt, right? right. And the park said, well, hold on. If you're going to fill it in with dirt, can we pile rocks on top of the dirt? And they're like, 
we usually put rocks under the dirt. It's like, yeah, we want it on top of the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the typical cheaper answer. Yeah. Like, yeah. So basically they're, they're, they're already in process of filling the thing in. I've seen some pictures of it, of the process and they've already got quite a bit of it. It might even all be filled in by now. Um, but they're going to put this just valley of rocks. I don't know. I didn't hear that they were going to emulate the Rubicon, but that's possible. But it's supposed to be like high end competition level trail when they're done. And there's this awesome overlook above it that's on a green trail. So you can literally drive like a pickup truck, right, up to this thing. Even a two wheel drive, you can get to this. And you can sit at this overlook and just watch these buggies crawl through here. It's going to be awesome when it's done. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to bring the Cherokee down now once that gets all yes. finished up. And uh, Yes, you are. Get you really a truck and a trailer, that. bring that thing down. I'd love to see you, you try to get through it. I, I toyed with the idea of building up the LJ to be able to do this trail. And I thought, you know, I just don't know if I have enough of that sort of trail that I would really enjoy that. But maybe there'll be a day in my future where I've got some other me other vehicle that's more of a buggy. I don't know. Yeah, because isn't um, uh, AOAA pretty close to you? Oh, yeah, it's like an hour from me. Yeah, so you so, could drive down there easy enough, especially if they add some of these hardcore trails that yep. might not be a, a bad idea. Yep. I mean, when the world's back open, last last summer I was probably there more than a dozen times. It's it's really the place that I call sort of home, if you know what I mean. It's a lot cheaper um, to go to than Roush, for sure. It is. Uh, for a single day, it's like half the price. You know, when you yeah. consider the fact that you have to pay for a membership at Roush and then wheel for the day. The wheel for the day piece is more expensive than just the daily pass at uh, at AOAA. Yeah, because I literally go down uh, almost every year. Uh, I'm not 100% sold if I'm going down this year uh, for crawling for cops down at Roush Creek. And uh, it's a great event. But like the fact that I'm out of state, so I'm not going to drive the six hours to get down there as often as I would like. And yeah. I had to pay $50 for a membership fee. And then like, I think it's another $20 to wheel for the weekend. And I'm like, that, that's a lot of money to, and I'm already spending a lot on gas to get down there. Yeah. It's, yeah. The way you describe it, it sounds like Roush is at least a little cheaper than I remembered. It used to be like 70 for the year and then another 35 per day, but I haven't wheeled it in 10 years. It could when be. It, I, I don't remember exactly, but I think it well, was right somewhere around there. When, uh, when AOAA was in its infancy, before it was even open yet, I had a friend who was very involved. He lives like minutes from the park. And he was he was very interested in seeing it get off the ground. And he basically convinced us to stop wheeling Roush Creek, Roush Creek and start wheeling AOAA because he wanted to make sure people knew this was a great park. And I haven't gone back. <laughs> Nothing against Roush Creek. It's a great park. But AOAA has enough. I know the park. I just, I, I have a great time every time I'm there. I don't see any reason to switch parks and, and pay an extra membership fee and all that stuff. So, yeah, I've only I, I've only been to AOAA once, but some of those trails there seemed more difficult than some of the Roush trails. Like they have some like extreme red trails that I came across, and I was like, mm -hmm. "Wow, that is like straight up ledge, like twelve feet in the air. Like yep. it's crazy." A lot of a lot of folks that I know, I mean, I, I also guide for the Jeep Jamboree there. So a lot of people that also guide there are very familiar with Roush Creek as well. And they say that AOAA um, greens, the high greens are like Roush Creek blues, right? The low That's blues, crazy. Yeah. And the, the blues borderline on blacks at Roush Creek. Now, obviously, Roush Creek also still has some tougher trails at the upper end as well. And they have some pretty crazy stuff, too. I've been on it with my other my my old Jeep, my YJ, which was much more built than uh, the lj is now but um yeah so that's kind of the comparison that i've heard from a lot of people which one has more land or are they about even uh aoa i think has more land because they have two halves to the property there's yeah, like when i went there they were only allowing us to go on one half of it or something like that they opened up different halves different times or yeah something. so there's the east property and the west property the west property the, the, at the far reaches of it are still actively mined so it's constantly kind of changing so you have to be aware of that which is why people like me guide out there right so that gotcha uh you can you you know where you should go and where you shouldn't go um not that you can't get that from the folks at the park office but at any rate uh i i want to say it's something like twelve thousand acres or something i don't know how big wow. roush is at this point but i thought roush was smaller maybe i'm wrong i know they, they expanded land. They expanded recently. I know Roush expanded a couple of years ago. Yeah, they added some uh, 
they added some pretty fun trails. Uh, they added a crawling for cops trail that mm -hmm. went on last year and that that's a pretty fun trail. It has a, a pretty steep downhill uh, near the end. That's just like a bunch of loose boulders and it's uh, pretty sketchy going down there. Yeah. Yeah. I bet there's, there's some of those at Roush. I remember, I don't even remember where it was in that park, but I remember a trail where I was in my YJ before it was sprung over and I come down off this little ledge with the driver's side tire and literally it just fell into a hole that seemed to go on forever. And I'm like right on my rocker big rock right in there right in oh. front of the front edge of the rocker right into the body i'm like this oh, no. sucks <laughs> that is rough yeah yeah i mean whatever i was able to back up off of it and then i took a different line to get around the big hole but yeah it just you can't it looked it did not look that <laughs> that that's that dumb, that big of a hole that's for dang sure yeah, it's, it's definitely hard judging some obstacles unless you've been on them. You kind of learn yeah. the lines and stuff. Yep. Yep. Another reason that people like to have guides. So, <laughs> so I think so, I think that's um, fun sometimes, but sometimes it takes uh, almost some of the fun out of it. I almost like it, the exploring yeah. nature of it. Yeah, no, I'm not I'm not saying every time you go out you should have a guide, but especially if you're new, right? And that's that's mainly what I do when I guide. Um there I there's a uh, a company here in PA run by a guy that I've known since the Paragon days. It's called Off-Road Consulting and he does training and he does guided rides. And that's really his brain, his bread and butter. He'll do winch training. He'll do off-roading training. He'll do recovery training, like all these things that he thinks are really important. Um, and then he just does guided rides. It's like two a, two a month. And usually what you get are, you know, folks that either don't know the park well enough and they don't want to get lost or they just don't know where they're going or don't quite know what they're doing. The guided rides aren't quite for training, but they're for, you know, you get a group of people, you start to pick stuff up and eventually people sort of graduate out of that and then they go out on their own instead. So that's, that's mainly what they're for. Yeah. I agree I, with you. Exploring is, is part of the fun. Well, I, I think the the issue too, with uh, uh, especially the new wheelers exploring, uh, I see a lot of specifically JKs, not to say they're the only crowd, but like your JKs and your JLs, the newer people getting into newer Jeeps and they have they have like the dealership lift them and they just dump a bunch yep. of money and they think it's going to do everything but you have to learn to drive and maneuver through obstacles you're not just gonna throw money at it and make it better yeah i actually have a video coming out about this it's coincidentally uh it's coming out monday and it's titled get out there and wheel and uh, i recommend you go watch it when it comes out because it's really similar sentiment it's you know you don't need yeah. to, you don't need to pour a bunch of money into your Jeep to get out there and enjoy the sport. And I recommend that you don't. I recommend that you get out there and learn your Jeep. And well, you know, it's kind of like I think the like the video I I made uh, back a while ago that was uh, I think you should wheel your Jeep stock because yeah, too many people are just oh yeah I got a Jeep now I'm gonna lift it and put big tires on it. But I think you kind of miss out doing that uh, learning what your jeep can do stock especially these jks and jls like these are super capable rigs they are. right off the production line if and you if you have deep enough pockets to get you a rubicon you've got a really capable jeep i mean four ten gears four to one transfer case yeah. like the lockers and the transfer case alone and that disconnect double sway bar you can do blues easy all day long yeah i mean yeah you don't even have to try yeah Right. I mean, you've got, you've got all the, all the tools at, at your disposal. Now, obviously if you're brand new, you're going to want to learn a bit before you go hopping straight on the blues, but the Jeep is capable. You could probably do blacks if you have a good spotter and you have a little bit of experience in a, in a plain old Rubicon. Right. Plain old stock. Yeah. Cause like uh, my, my Jeep, my JK, it's just a, a sport. It's the Islander package. So it just has some fancy seats and stuff, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I had that open, open for the longest time wheeling. And then I, added the rear Aussie locker and night and day difference. But oh, uh, yeah. I, I don't think I would have, I don't think I'd wheel as well as I do now if I didn't wheel it more stock in the stock form first. Yeah. It's really good to learn it. And in fact, uh, Kyle who runs off road consulting, he recommends that if you're going to put lockers in, they should be selectable and you should leave them off all the time until you need them. Turn them on until you need them, until you don't need them anymore, and then turn them back off again. It's like there's there's no reason. Now, obviously, 
selectable lockers are more expensive than auto lockers. So uh, he's not saying everybody should go out and spend a grand on lockers just to get a selectable. But he said, if you can get them, get the selectable and you should use them sparingly because it puts less strain on your drivetrain and it makes you a better wheeler because, you know, you're not dependent on that thing having the, the extra traction. Yeah, definitely. It uh, seemed to almost take some of the the challenge out of being because like yeah. this, I hit the same obstacles and it, it's like it's not as hard anymore. Now, on the other hand, if your goal was to be able to hit harder trails, you know, yeah, go to harder success. trails. There's your challenge, right? Uh, in the the YJ that I had, it was also an Islander. So I, I love seeing your <laughs> your JK Islander because it reminds me of the old YJ Islander. Um, not quite the same styling, but it was almost the same color as yours. Um, I got a lot of flack for it, though. I don't know if you do, <laughs> but it was a girly color. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, everyone seems to to love the, uh, I think it's surf pearl blue. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, this was this was called seafoam blue, if I remember correctly. It wasn't like the powder blue YJ Islander. It was it was like a metallic blue, very similar to yours, but a lot of people huh. called it teal and made fun of it. But anyway, the point was um, I had put a Cherokee Dana 44 in the back of that uh, before I had gone spring over. And then eventually I put four tens and a Detroit auto locker in the back. And that thing would go just about anywhere that I wanted it to go. And it was only on 33 TSL radials. So, you know, there's a lot to be said for just getting some seat time, learning how the thing works and get out there and wheel it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so real quick, I wanted to touch on cameras. I know we both recently upgraded cameras. Uh, we got the, the same uh, Canon camera, the M50. Mm -hmm. how, how, do you, how do you like that camera so far? And how do you feel about people wanting to maybe start a YouTube channel? Um, how important do you think camera the camera is in the whole process? So I, I love that camera. Once I figured out how to get 4K and how to get it to focus the way I needed it to, which was a little bit of a of a hassle, not a hassle, but it just took a bit of a learning curve. And you helped me with some of that. Thank you. Um, once I learned that, I mean, it is just the, the picture quality, the video quality that comes out of this thing is night and day different than what I was using, which was a GoPro Hero 7. The GoPro Hero 7 is a great camera. Don't get me wrong. And I recorded on, on the GoPro for about a year and it's 4K and it gets good detail and I can put it in positions that I'm not afraid that it's going to get hurt. Uh, so I wouldn't say you shouldn't use that sort of a camera, but if you can get it and if you're willing to be careful with your camera device and whatnot, it is, it is a damn nice video or damn nice quality comes out of that thing. In fact, uh, I don't, I don't remember if I told you guys this, but when Dirt Lifestyle did that video where he had people submit videos yep. for his hunt for his one year, um, I sent him a video just saying like, you know, you've inspired me to do this, that or whatever. And maybe you watched it, but um, he wrote me and he's like, are you still using a GoPro? I'm like, no, no, I bought a new camera. He goes, oh, he's like, if you're still using a GoPro, I need to look at him again because that looks awesome. <laughs> that was the M50. <laughs> yeah, like I, I was quite amazed with it just like right out of the box because um, I had shot on my Canon T3i for a while and I was shooting in 1080p, but even the 1080p on this M50 is just such a different level of 1080p like i don't know if it's the dynamic range in the camera or the, the yeah. quality like what it is but it just looks 10 times better i want to say what i sent him was 1080 because i hadn't figured out 4k yet it was literally like the second thing i'd recorded on on the new camera so i didn't want to send him something that was out of focus so i just went back to the 1080 which was auto focused and uh yeah even that he said it's just like that's he was impressed at the at the uh, at the, at the the image quality, which kind of says something, right? Because he's like all about getting the highest quality he can. Yeah, and like um, I I don't know if you do this too, but like I'll shoot a majority of my videos with it in 1080p and shoot some of the stuff that I don't have to worry about focus as much in 4K, and then I'll put it all in a, a 4K timeline and just upscale mm -hmm. the 1080 footage and it it looks amazing even just 1080 yeah. upscaled. Yeah, I do. I do that. Um, especially with some of my older footage, if I ever need to bring in a clip from an older video, 
that because they're not 4k i'll upscale them and they look okay I, I usually try to get everything i can on the m50 in 4k but i haven't done a lot of outdoor i haven't done a lot of wheeling footage with it yet so i think that the lack of autofocus on 4k is going to be a problem there so it's probably going to get shot in 1080 or something that does have the autofocus when i do that so i'll probably do the same thing you're talking about yeah, I, I haven't really got it outdoors and uh, well, I mean, I've been outside uh, shooting some videos, but I yeah. haven't done any wheeling trips with it yet. So I'm interested to see how it's going to perform on that. Uh, one thing I was kind of uh, weary about is the I, I was going to put the tiny little uh, Rode microphone. Uh, what is it? The, the micro or the go the or video something. micro. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to put that on there. But the uh, like stabilization thing was kind of just wobbling back and forth way too much. I, yeah. I don't know if it's just a smaller cold shoe mount or whatever, but I ended up putting the big long microphone on there and it, it yeah. looks ridiculous because the camera is so small. Camera's so small. It, it definitely uh, it, yeah, it I, works. I use the video micro on mine. Does yours not have the little tensioner on it? It has the tensioner on it, but it, it just seems like it, it was flexing a lot and it... Uh, I didn't like the way it was moving where the, yeah. the, the go is a little bit beefier and stronger. So, yeah, no, mine's, I mean, it works well enough. It's the only mic I have though. So I, I don't have a mic to switch to. Um, I find that it works better indoors than it does outdoors because the pickup isn't great if you're more than a few feet away from the thing. Whereas yeah. if you're indoors, you've got, you know, all the audio sort of stays, you know, in the room that you're in. So it's a little easier for the mic to pick it up. Outdoors, it's a lot more, I don't want to say washed out. It still sounds good, but you're fainter, right? It doesn't pick it up quite as well. I actually uh, which... learned a, a kind of a hack for the like audio quality. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it does seem to work is you in the camera settings itself, you put the volume down all the way to the, the bottom and then uh, go back up two clicks and it seems like it would be really low, but I guess the cam Canon cameras themselves kind of tend to over, uh, like amplify the, the audio or something. I've so noticed you, that. Then, so then when you bring it into Premiere or whatever, then you can uh, boost it up and change it around there. And it, it sounds a little bit crisper. I'll have to try that because I've noticed on some of the stuff I've recorded with the M50 with the external mic, uh, I get some clipping. Like you oh, hear that yeah. little that little crackle at the upper end, yeah. And it bothers me because I'm anal about that kind of stuff. Viewers might not even notice it. I don't know. Maybe now everyone's going to go look at my videos and go, "Yeah, yeah, I hear it." <laughs> <laughs> you know how that goes. Um, but you had a second part to your question about how strongly do I feel about needing a a good camera to do a YouTube channel, right? Yep. That's kind of where you're going with that, right? Right. Um, to be honest, a lot of YouTubers will tell you this: start with what you have right? Because a lot of, I mean, look at Lightbright. They record on like a freaking iPhone. Yeah. Most all, of their, a, everything on the, like, I don't think they have another camera. I think it's all just her iPhone. Yeah. If you, if you watch some of their recent videos, they did pick up some kind of an action camera. It was the Osmo, I think. Um, but most of what they record is on her iPhone with, with the same video micro, uh, external microphone. Cause you've, you see her in some videos where she's holding it up on a little selfie stick thing. Yeah, uh, with the with the microphone on top, but all on an iPhone, which is I guess it's great when you're traveling all over the place. You need something that's small. You can fit in your pocket and pull it out whenever you want to make a video. So, and they've got over a hundred thousand subscribers, right? So, the the camera gear isn't everything, right? But then you have Dirt Lifestyle who puts everything he can into getting the best shot, and it shows. He has some awesome looking videos. They're high quality. They're well shot. They're well edited i mean they're just that guy could have been working in film all these years instead of as a plumber right. <laughs> no offense to plumbers right i'm just saying he's got a talent there maybe he had a talent as a plumber too but um you know you've got two ends of the spectrum and they're both really successful channels so i don't think the camera is as important as how you're using it right the old the old saying right it's not what you have it's how you use it um i started with a uh, i think literally my first video was recorded on the front facing camera on an old tablet that I had, that I had mounted to the wall in the garage that I was using for music. Like it was go. what I had. It's what I started with. <laughs> so, you know, and that's, that's that damn tire changer video that I hate so much. That, <laughs> that, 
That thing That's getting has, those views, though. It's got like 100,000 views or something at this point. I cannot believe <laughs> how popular that video is. I hate it. <laughs> Maybe I need to go buy one from Harbor Freight and be like, hey, look, uh, I got one of these neat tire changers. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's, uh, maybe it's just, you know, having tires changed at a shop gets expensive and people are trying to look for a cheaper way. So they want to know, I don't know, but the amount of hate that I've gotten in the comments and the amount of like admiration I've gotten in the comments, I I can't believe how polarized that video is and how popular it is. (laughs) I was actually thinking about making a a video recently on how to uh, mount and dismount your own tire uh, because I... I've ha- I had to do it recently to put the, the bead locks on the JK and just did it with a s- set of tire spoons and right there in the driveway, some soapy water and yeah. that's all you really need. Yeah. I mean, no, I, balancing I did is it, another issue, but. Yeah. So I did it in, in that video with a high lift jack. I used that to unseat the bead. Yeah. And I then, had that too, yeah. and then I used the, uh, the, the, the breaker bar on the, the tire changer to unseat it from the rim, which was a a hassle in itself. Um, (laughs) As for balancing, believe it or not, this is like three years ago, I mounted the 33s on my Jeep. Maybe it's four years. And I put, you know, there's people are like, oh, you should try balancing beads. Well, balancing beads, you know, you're you're talking like a hundred bucks to get enough balancing beads for all your tires. And I was even too cheap for that. So I went out and got airsoft BBs. (laughs) Yeah, that (laughs) that actually works too. Yeah. And everyone's like, that'll never work. They'll biodegrade, you know, they'll, they'll degrade inside of your, your wheel. They want, and you see horror stories about people that have, that did it and they end up with like a, a mass of, of rubber inside of their tires. Well, airsoft babies from Walmart folks, it works. They're still in there. I still hear them rattling around. They still, they're, I don't think they're quite as well balanced as I, as I would have gotten from a shop, but they work well enough. I mean, I drove the thing to work 80, 80 miles a day back and forth. And uh, I never got like severe uh, tire wobble or anything out of it. So I don't know. I think with the air, <laughs> with the airsoft BBs, I, I heard like it's better to get the ones without the little seam in them. And then there was uh, something else that you wanted mm-hmm. to be aware of. Like there's a certain type you don't like, not every type will work as well, but they, they definitely do work. So the tires are getting close to the point where I'm going to start thinking about replacing them. And Bigger I'm definitely, tires. well, um, I don't know. It depends on how tall the Jeep is by then. Cause I've got two things fighting me. One is that the, I don't have much suspension lift on the Jeep. So if I go bigger tires, I need to make it taller. And two is that anyone who's watched the channel knows that my garage is very height challenged. If I go sure. any taller and put larger tires on the Jeep might not fit in the garage anymore. And then I can't record videos unless I'm outside in the street. And that's going to be a pain in the butt. So you just got to like dig out your basement or something. Yeah, I, I, I just recently watched this YouTube video. This guy had a, a, a short basement kind of like that. And yeah. he literally dug it out by hand and like lifted it all out. in just like the, the 10 gallon, five gallon buckets and just like hauled it out one bucket at a time. And like, he had a, a list at the end of how many buckets he used and stuff and he cemented it all in. It, it looked amazing when he was done but yeah that's a lot of backbreaking work right there yeah no i keep saying that what i'm probably going to have to do is eventually build a garage somewhere in order to continue the channel and build a build the jeep i want to build right or find a way to build a garage on this property which i don't think there's enough room for it right or so, like rent a shop somewhere i could rent a can... shop somewhere I've got a buddy who owns some land and he's not sure what he's going to do with it. And he's thinking about maybe building a garage on it. And he's like, cause me and me and him. And uh, if, you, if you guys have seen on the channel every now and then I got two, two folks I will with one in a silver JK and one in a red JK Blaine and Jay. Um, he's like, what, you know, what if I built the garage and we all went in on it? Right. Could we build like a three bay garage and then we could all have a place for our Jeeps and I don't know. So we'll see where all that all, all that pans out. I'm not making any guarantees, but you know, there's a couple options. So um, at any rate, what I want to do when the tires wear out is I want to crack one open and see what the balancing beans look like. <laughs> see what, see what those airsoft BBs have turned into over the years. <laughs> I'd be intrigued to see that too. Yeah. Yeah. So that's going to come up as, as soon as those tires are worn out. I don't know if I'm going to mount them myself again, um, but I'm definitely going to take one of them and dismount it and see what the balancing be- balancing beads look like before I go to the tire shop. <laughs> it's definitely a pain mounting a regular tire like 
beadlocks that's one thing it's it's a lot easier to to mount a beadlock because you don't have that front mm -hmm. lip that you have to pop it up oh over. yeah right right and a lot of people are giving me tips on how i should have used the tire care or the tire mounter uh tire machine sorry um that i just didn't know because i'd never mounted a tire before this was literally the, the that was that video was a, a recording of me doing the second tire i'd ever mounted i did one to see how it worked and then i turned on the video camera <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think we touched on it briefly too. Uh, like sometimes as YouTubers, we're putting out videos that we're just kind of maybe learning along the way or we're, we're showing something we found that makes a task easier. And mm -hmm. it, it's, it's just helping other Jeepers. It's just kind of extending that network of a Jeep family. Yeah, yeah. And that was my goal. That's always been my goal. And it's... Sometimes I, I throw out a softball where it's like, I just need to get a video out this week. But usually I really, I really put thought into what it is that I want to produce. And I want it to be something that people want to watch or something that's going to help people. So that's what I try Perfect. for anyway. All right. Well, I, I think that has been a, a successful podcast. I've been trying to keep these to a half hour ish. I have no idea like how long we've actually been running, but I'm pretty sure we went over. I always go over whenever I do anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I figure uh, we can only get better with these podcasts over time. So uh, I just wanted to thank you, Nate, for taking the time to uh, come on here and I'll make sure to link all of Nate's social media uh in the show notes below so you guys can check it out support another youtuber follow him and check out all of his stuff and uh we'll hopefully uh boost your subscriber count get you over 2000 and get you up and above and beyond keep going sure man absolutely if you ever want me back on just just ask you know where to find me awesome i'm, I'm sure sure we'll have you on again all right guys thanks for listening to the podcast and if you enjoyed it leave some feedback, leave a review, and make sure you share it with one of your friends who might enjoy this podcast. As always, guys, stay bearded, stay jeeping. I'm out.